Well, thank you for coming. I know a lot of seminars, a lot of activities, and sometimes it's difficult to, to have a full session. Uh, we are coming from IFAPA, it's the Andalusian Institute for Training and Research on Agriculture and Fisheries. Our center is in El Puerto de Santa Maria, very close from here. Okay, and we're going to present uh, results from our, ten, our last 10 years of work in the Guadalquivir, but also because this project is a continuation of this long-term monitoring, which started in CSIC, in, uh, in the Instituto de Ciencias Marinas de Andalucía, also with the University of Córdoba and Instituto Español de Oceanografía. So we're going to put data together, but also our own data from the last 10 years. So, as I said, this is project, the, the LTR, the Long-Term Ecological Research, started in 1997 and has been funded by different uh, administration, but mainly from Junta Andalucía. Since 2010, <coughs> IFAPA is the responsible of the, of the project, collaborating with the Spanish Institution of Oceanography also, and some collaboration with the SIC, but we are the yeah, the responsible of the of the project, okay? And all the project in the last 10 years has been funded by European funds for fisheries and, and maritime. Well, maybe most of you know the Guadalquivir story is here, but I like this picture because you see from other perspective how the Gulf of Cadiz, how big is the Gulf of Cadiz and how the Guadalquivir story it's in the middle and it's a very important factor on some of the circulation and fisheries and ecosystem in the Gulf of Cadiz. From the Latin, estus, estuary means where the tide finds the river flow. They are considered as the most, one of the, among the most productive ecosystems and they present a very high diversity on both habitats, niche, and species, because the encounter of salt or marine war real with the river ecosystem. And they also offer historically multiple ecosystem services, and they are, because of that, the, the origin of Greek civilization. Multiple ecosystem services as water, fresh water for irrigation and for, for, for agriculture, mm, maritime commerce, shipping, irrigation, aquaculture, the rice fields, but also conservation, Doñana, it's important part of the estuary system, big cities, tourism, the wine, gastronomy, and the fishery as we will see at the end of this talk. The estuary is important not because the proper ecosystem, but also because many fish species in the marine realm depend on coastal system for their life, for completing their, their life stage. This is an example. I like because the, the draw, but some species use different habitats during their, their life. Like the uh, open sea, they go to mangrove or estuary like this case, wetland, beach, um, seagrass, and then go to, to temporary to reefs. One very important thing in the Guadalquivir story is that the water is controlled, the fresh water inflow is controlled by a dam. You maybe know, it's the Alcalá del Rio Dam. It's 110 kilometer upstream, built in 1930, okay? And how we manage this dam is going to influence on how much water and how it goes to the, to the story. It's important, and uh, it's the, the, the heart of this project because it's a very important nursery area for a lot of fishes and crustaceans. It's a very important area for the juveniles. We have been sampling mainly three sites, Tarfia, Esparraguera, and Bonanza. You will see in the, in the rest of the talk these names. And uh, on that way, we cover mostly the four areas for all the salinity gradient, like from oligoline waters to the eualine and marine waters. 
kind of data that we have been collecting. Since 1997, mainly the abundant densities of more than 145 or 200 species, present absence and size structure, and basic uh, variable like temperature, salinity, and turbidity. From 2002, we added the chlorophyll nutrients and by stomach analysis, food web uh, works, food web analysis. From 2000, since 2010, we are collecting monthly the micro and mesozooplankton. From 2013, we started to do stable isotopes and fatty acids in a seasonal, with a seasonal period. And we started to study something that it wasn't, is the phytoplankton in a proper way. Phytoplankton by microscope, by fatty acid analysis, and in a very difficult realm because the turbidity and because the, the sediments. But we, you will see the, the results. And also we are collaborating in studying plastic contamination and metal contamination. And also since 2017, we are recording uh, with a multi-parametric zone, more variable, you will see, and starting to work on primary production. This is a video, so you can see more or less how we sample music. <laughs> so this, we do all the samplings since 97 in a glass eel typical fish fishery boat. I mean, they so we sample monthly at two sites now, it was on three. Uh, with this boat, with three big nets, they are like three meters by three meters, okay? The four tides each day. So we sample in the flood, in the ebb, flood, ebb, in Tarfia now, and in Bonanza. So we cover like more or less the last 50 kilometers of the story. This is the typical capture, or the sampling, <laughs> depending. These are langostino from San Lucar. They go in also, anchovies. And these are mycetes. They are the most abundant group by myomas and by abundance in the, in the story. These, uh, these are anchovies, these are sea bass. Not, sometimes we have to go to mud. To <laughs> and these are something that we are starting to work also now because these are the big, I mean, we, we found a lot of microfitoventos there, like this green, the green uh, mud film. Mud flats? No, mud, yes, in the, in the mud flats, we see a lot of microfitoventos. It's green most of the year. Quickly, some of the, to, to describe the system, some, only, only some important variables, like temperature is totally seasonal. We find winter, summer, winter, summer, very, very seasonal, but with a big range of temperature. We can go from 10 degrees in winter to the 27 or 28 degrees in the water in summer. So it's a, it's a very high dynamic system, not only by salinity, but also the temperature that the organism has to be adapted to. And important, it's, this, it's very homogeneous in all the history. It's the same, the color is the three sides. It's very, very similar in the, the last 50 kilometers of the history. However, it's not the salinity. In the salinity, the red is in Bonanza, is the, it's close to the sea, and blue is Tarfia, it's more in the upstream. And you see the big salinity gradient, okay? It's not so seasonal because it changes a lot. Some years are seasonal, some years not. And all is going to depend on the dam management. Also some because the rain, but mainly because the dam management. Some draw, draw year, there's no rain. You have a, B, a, a clear salinity gradient for most of the year. But the years where they open or, or very rainy years, then you have low salinities and, and more variables. So the salinity gradient, change a lot, okay? 
we stopped the green here because since 2013 we stopped this intermediate site. Too much work <laughs> we couldn't afford. Turbidity is maybe the most famous in the Guadalquivir, you know? it's like the chocolate river and it's not so bad always. So usually it goes, it have a mean of 300 NTU, usually it's in this ranch and only some events, some dam, open events and whatever, and produce big, big turbidity events, very, very like, this is like, I don't know, it was, it was like nine grams, like nine grams of solids in per liter. So it's, it's a lot, it's this point. But it only happened in some years, okay? Recently, these data are from December. 26, 28, December, then 2019, this Christmas, after the rains, they, uh, the, the dam was open and we found a very big increase in, in turbidity again. Okay, what I said, the turbidity is totally related with the, when they open the dam. And red is the water, is the water circulation from the dam when they open, okay? So we, we see the big events. It's an ecosystem, very, very, so high in nutrients, but we found for nitrates, we found like very seasonal cycles in nutrients. They, so in winter, enters a lot of nutrients and they are more or less consumed to summer and then start again with the, with the rain. Okay, this is the, the year, okay. And also silicates, just to, the, we found this in the last 2018, it was rainy. So we have a lot of water coming into the estuary and we found big concentration of, of silicates, but they go almost to zero because no water was coming in the, into the estuary. And now we're finding again an increase after the last rains, after the last dam opening, okay? Uh, yes. Okay, these are the two sides. This is the continuous recording that we do now with this, uh, with this multi-parametric zone. So for this is, for example, December, 2000 to December 17. This is the typical salinity in Tarfia, so low with the tide, and this typical salinity in Bonanza. Okay, it goes from, from 10 to 25, and it changes with the ebb, with the flood, with the ebb, with the flood. In red is turbidity, so higher in the upper part and lower close to the sea. And very, very interesting thing is that turbidity goes very similar with this chlorophyll. At first, we thought that the device wasn't working. <laughs> it was like, okay, this is... But we did some experiments and we, yeah, we, we checked and it works. And it's something that we are working is maybe, or it should be because there's a suspension from all these mud flats and all these microfitoventos. So this is something that we are working on, okay? In general, very quick, uh, the community, it, uh, well, we have found like almost more than 280, 280 taxa, different taxa without counting phytoplankton or bacteria, or of course, I mean, just fishes and crustaceans. And so 85 species of fishes, 50 of crustaceans, and it's very diverse, okay? Most of the biomass is composed by some species like mycetes and anchovies, shrimps, and other typical estuarine fishes like the pomatochistus. And also marine species that comes in wounds in the spring for, yeah, for, for the nursery function, like sardines, sea bass, etc. Okay. When we analyze, we found a very seasonal dynamic. Okay. So it goes from spring to summer, they go off in winter, and then the abundance increases in, in the spring again. So it's very typical, mm, it's a very seasonal dynamic. And it only apparts when the big dam events, and then they go apart from the typical pattern. 
This is temperature and salinity define the community composition during all the, for, for all the story, okay? The, we have been analyzing the food web and it's based on phytoplankton, that's the next talk now, and on organic matter via detritus and bacteria. It goes to zooplankton, mainly to mice that are the most abundant, as I said, and then we found a lot of other fauna. Shrimps are very abundant, and then fishes. These are like, in summary, the big groups in the, in the Guadalquivir story. We are going to talk now about this trophic interaction mostly. Pedro is going to talk about phytoplankton in the story, and then I'll talk about how mycets are defining anchovies, not in the story only, but also in the Gulf of Cadiz. Connecting as an end-to-end agricultural or water, freshwater management inland with the fishery economy in the Gulf of Cadiz, two activities that maybe they, you don't think they are related, but they are very, very related. Okay, I'll, I will give a brief talk about the phytoplankton in the, the World Kiwi Restory and, and try to describe the importance of this uh, community uh, supporting the, the food web in the, <coughs> in the estuary. Uh, first, first of all, I just want to stress about the importance of the determining the tr what we call the trophic efficiency in, in any aquatic food web. And here it uh, has been uh, expressed like, like uh, what could be a low trophic value food web and a high trophic value food web, which can give to uh, what we call inverted biomass pyramids in aquatic e ecosystems, uh, as long as this uh, base in the food web is uh, of high quality enough to, to support uh, a high dynamic up in the upper uh, trophic, trophic uh, levels. Uh, we have developed some tools to quantify this, this trophic value, the phytoplankton that I, I will say, and it's a rather important topic in aquatic ecology, especially for trying to explain the exploitation of fisheries resources. And uh, it's very connected with the, the, this uh, production in the, in the low, low levels. Uh, it is also uh, important in other fields of ecology. I just wanted to, to remain here that, uh, well, in also in other aspects of ecology, the nutritional eco uh, ecology is important. Um, because I know there's some bird people here, I just broke this reference talking about the the, import, the relationship between some wooden birds and the nutritional value of the microphytoventals in some histories. So it's uh, something which is important in many, many aspects of the ecology. Well, uh, in the history, has, as Cesar has explained, we have a full salinity gradient from this point uh, to uh, till the, the mouse, and so uh, by uh, sampling all these uh, transect, we, we have uh, checked how is this, uh, this phyto phytoplankton. I have said this is a the challenge of studying phytoplankton in, in highly chilly water because microscopy is, is really complicated to, to, to use. Because you, you, when you bring the sample, you, you have this, this kind of water. And just in a few minutes, if you settle down, then you can have a, uh, what would happen in a, in a pond in a marsh. That you have the, the all sediment uh, settled down. Well, phytoplankton, as, as I said here, is the main contributor to suspending particular organic matter nutritional quality. It's, uh, quantitatively, it's very, very, very low, but qualitatively, it's really important. It defines the quality of this uh, particular matter. In the wild kibit, we have salinity as the main dri driving force structuring the phytoplankton from the fresh water to the seawater reaches. Uh, temperature as, act as seasonally, it modulates 
more quantitatively, not qualitatively, but quantitatively phytoplankton. And nutrients are in excess and they don't represent any, any factor. They don't limit production, of course. And it's uh, light, of course, as you can see, is the main limiting factor in this history. Well, when you look at the mic under the microscope, you see something like this. You, well, you can see, of course, some micro, micro uh, phytoplankton, large species, but you, you see a lot of sediments, which make, make it difficult to, to, to tell whether they, they are uh, other species belonging to the nano or the phytoplankton, which are very, very uh, short in size and can't be detected using microscopy. So to avoid this or to compensate for this problem, we have developed some uh, biochemical tools. Uh, we know, we are aware about the pigments. Pigments is commonly used in oceanography and estuaries. Uh, we know also that phytosterols are also very specific for taxonomic uh, group in phytoplankton. But we know that fatty acids are even richer than these other compounds. And that's why we uh, de uh, define a, a big library of fatty acids to, to be able to quantify this uh, 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 phytoplankton community. Well, just to have a, a general view, we have some pictures of uh, microphytoplankton, large species, as I, as I said, which uh, uh, are, has been detected in the Guadalquivir. We have diatoms, as you, you can see here, many diatoms, many different uh, kinds of diatoms. We have chlorophytes as well. These are the main species of chlorophytes that have been detected in the, in the estuary. Other groups, dinoflagellates, cryptophytes, haptophytes, and, well, cyan cyanobacteria, and so on. These are all groups that have been identified microscopically, and we have a uh, Measure we have determined the diversity, which, as you can see here, is very constant throughout the salinity gradient and also seasonally. But you have to tell, you have to notice that this uh, diversity is, me is, me is measured only at the genus level, so the diversity can cannot be very high because the capability to determine to, to identify at the species level is very difficult. When we use the result from what we call functional groups uh, inferred from fatty acids. We, of course, we, we found lower diversity because the level at, the, at which we make the, 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 the analysis is lower. It's normally the, the class level, which is uh, taxonomically less, less diverse. But well, this is uh, not so important. Well, with fatty acids, we have uh, specific fatty acids, as, as, as I said. This is, uh, well, general root of fatty acid metabolisms in microalgae. Um, we, we know that some of them are specific for, for example, uh, cocolithophysia. For diatoms, we have specific fatty acids. We have for dinoflagellates, also for cryptophytes, for chlorophytes. So each taxonomic group has their own fatty acid signature. So this is enable, enable us, rhodophytes, well, enables us to apply uh, matrix, iterative matrix calculations. The same analysis that is used for pigments, we can just change pigments from fatty acids and, and achieve the, the, the inferring of the, uh, the structure of the community. So different tax, different classes can be separate just yes, in base of their fatty acids, as I illustrate here. And what is interesting to note is that both freshwater and marine species belonging to the same class has very similar fatty acid profiles. Uh, fatty acids can also be used to, to, de to establish a nutritional index. This is an, an, a nutritional index that uh, we developed for different classes of uh, phytoplankton, which is based on the requirements of consumers both zooplankton and bivalves. So based on these uh, requirements, we, we, we could develop this index, which indicates that dinoflagellates are the, the richer, the, highly, the highest nutrition uh, uh, class, 
and we also, of course, have diatom quality of uh, aptophytes, uh, eustigmatophytes, and, and at the bottom we have the lower nutritional value here uh, with the cyanobacteria and chlorophytes. These are the species which lower nutritional value from this point of view. Well, when we make this analysis, we find that the, in, the, in the estuary, both seasonally and through the salinity gradient, both, most of the, the taxonomic classes uh, behave a different way. We have dino, dinoflagellates increasing with salinity normally. Diatoms are constant throughout the salinity gradient. And other groups like cyanobacteria are more abundant in the fresh water and tend to decrease with seawater. And there are other, other least, uh, less abundant groups that you can see here, but it will take too long to, 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 to explain each of them. In the generally, we have that aptophyte and dinoflagellates tend to concentrate in the, saline, in the more salty waters and cyanobacteria, chlorophytes, and euglenophytes in the freshwater uh, reaches. Uh, it's interesting to note that cryptophysia is uh, very, very undetected in, in the estuary. We still don't know why, but uh, we, we couldn't detect it either microscopically or with uh, fatty acid biomarkers. <laughs> Well, we can also use fatty acids to, to establish the ratio between, between phototrophic and heterotrophic microorganisms. So we, we could use uh, all these specific bacterial fatty acids to quantify with a simple mixing model and determine the proportion of, of uh, uh, phytoplankton contribution to the microbial community that uh, occur between uh, uh, across the different seasons and the, the salinity. We, we, we see that summer is the, the season where the proportion of uh, autotrophic uh, microorganisms is, is some, somewhat higher, around 60%, respecting to, to the other, to the other uh, uh, seasons. We can also determine the contribution of uh, phytoplankton and microbial uh, community to the total particulate carbon. In the estuary, we, we have uh, about a maximum of four milligrams per liter of, of, of organic carbon. This change slightly with uh, uh, decreasing with the, during the spring and summer. But what is interesting to see here is that the, the green part is the, the phytoplankton carbon the red one is the microbial carbon, and the rest is detrital carbon, which is difficult to use. It's a carbon, refractory carbon, which is almost uh, uh, impossible to, to be used by the consumers. So this brings, us, brings up the, what I said before about the, the qualitative importance of phytoplankton, not quantitative in terms of uh, carbon. From the nutritional point of view, uh, and applying the index before, uh, that I explained before, uh, just it's interesting to, to see how the nutritional value increases with salinity, particularly during summer. So we can see here that as we increase salinity, the community, the microbial, the, the entire microbial community, uh, is increasing in nutritional value as we go to the uh, higher range of temperature. And this is about, we have, a, we have been able to quantify it for the first time. We, have, we, we can say that this nutritional value is 2.2 fold higher than the nutritional value in, in the fresh water reaches. Mm. And similarly, in summer, we also have some more nutritional value respecting to, to winter. This is, but this is the microbial community, but this is strongly influenced by phytoplankton. And this can be illustrated here when you plot 
is fatty, the fatty acid nutritional index with the proportion of phytoplankton and also with the ratio of carbon between phytoplankton and the microbial community, you, you can see positive correlation indicating the importance of phytoplankton in this contribution of the nutritional, nutritional index. The other, well, uh, other indicators are here are correlated. This is, these are conventional or traditional indicators of nutritional quality. We have, we, we have seen that, for, for example, the, the CN ratio, which is a traditional index for nutritional quality, in, in particular in matter, doesn't work in the, the estuary because the, probably the excess carbon and nitrogen the, that that is in, uh, masking the effect of the, the really important particles. And we find that the, the, the fatty acid index uh, explains the more, more of the variability in, re, in re relation to other indexes, particularly to talking about salinity, so especially. While seasonally, there are other important markets which are more related to, to chlorophyll. But what really interesting us here, that is the, the, the salinity, uh, is better explained by fatty, fatty acids. Hmm? This is uh, the same, illustrating, as, as I said before, the CN ratio practically doesn't change, while other indicators are more variable. The total lipids, as you see here, are also very constant, but they are very useful for quantifying the microbial, the total microbial community. And uh, finally, this is the, the relationship between the, this fatty acid nutritional index. This is uh, for a year period, and this is seasonal. And it's, it's interesting to see that the, the salinity is always correlating positively with uh, the fatty acid, while other indicators of uh, productivity, like temperature, for example, temperature and irradiance, are only positive during the more limiting months, let's say uh, autumn and, and, and winter. In spring and summer, when the conditions are supposed to be a bit more favorable, they, they, they are not related with uh, the fatty acid. Uh, nutritional index. And that's all. I hope that you uh, enjoy. <laughs> okay, so from end to end, in summary, Pedro explained how, how important um, is the, the phytoplankton nutritional value and how it's concentrated in the last part of the story. It's so now I'm going to talk about the other end, like the, the, the fishes in the estuary and the relationship with the fisheries in the Gulf of Cadiz. Okay, this is just a picture to demonstrate again how the influence, how big the influence of the estuary could be in the, in the Gulf of Cadiz. This is 2018 event, I think. In the Gulf of Cadiz, two of the main fisheries are sardine or anchovies. Both species are in clear decline for fishery for the last years. Maybe you know problems with, this, with the sardine fishery. They are going to close, they don't want to close, and all the social economy problems that they generate in all the Cadiz and Huelva coast, okay? And why the story? Because also pelagic species like sardine and anchovies have or present this cycle in their li early life stage. Anchovies, for example, spawn in the Doñana coast, okay, in February, March, and then the juvenile, the post larvae and juveniles go into the estuary and they spend there like three, four months until they go mainly at the end of the summer, autumn, they go out and the juveniles recruit to the, to the stock. Just calling a stock because it's going to be fished. <laughs> it's not the population. It's going, these are the, this is the population is going to be fished. And one characteristic in the Gulf of Cadiz is that the anchovy fisheries is mainly on the zero year age. 
So most of the fishery depends on the recruitment every year. Both species go into the estuary for nursery from spring to summer, but we see, for example, a very clear temporal niche differentiation. Sardine is the blue, anchovy is the red, and since 1997, these are monthly data, we see how sardine also ahead is go, it goes in the history in the winter from January, December, January to March, and then anchovy goes in. This is the total biomass of everything in the history. All the biomass of all the all the organisms together. Okay, as you as you see, it's very seasonal. Some year we have more, some year we have less, and it reproduces the most abundant species. Is this mycet uh, mesopodosis slavery? And we can see here swimming. And these big captures when when the glacial fishing are mostly mycetes. This big white mass are mostly mycetes. There are three species of mycetes. This is Mesopotosis library. This is Tartessicus, what is an endemic species in the Guadalquivir. And there, there is another species, Neomyces. It's more in the, it habits more the, the river upstream waters. And the three are the main components of the mycete gill in the, in the Guadalquivir estuary. It's very important what Pedro said. Most of the nutritional value of the phytoplankton and organic matter, it's in the middle part of the story. It goes, it rises with salinity, but it's very important, maybe not five, but from 10 to 20. Okay, it's the, in contrary, it's the middle part, the polyaline, mesoaline waters, and there we find the most of the biomass, always. More. No, these are all the data together. We can split and see, but most of the biomass in the history, fishery, like the nursery, the fish, the, the shrimps, are in this part. And why? These are stabilized of data, nitrogen and, and carbon. Okay, just to summarize, the pictures are for the mesoline part, for the mesoline area. Okay, and what do we see? We can see how Typical freshwater organisms like Neomyces, some freshwater or other mesoline copepods and carps have a signal very close to the terrestrial matter. While mycetes, mesopodosis mainly, and their, their predators show more a carbon signal close to benthic diatoms or the mix of diatoms with bacterial loop, what is very difficult to separate with isotopes. But it's described that it's around minus 20, minus 18, minus 22. This is only one example. We have been following isotope say, seasonally since 2014, 13. We have some more data, but just to show that most of the biomass is concentrated on this signal of minus 20, minus 18. Okay? So that's why it's so important to see this nutritional value. With chlorophyll, we can measure a lot of chlorophyll sometimes. But if it is, if it is cyanobacteria, it's no nutritional value. So we cannot relate high chlorophyll with high biomass or with high nursery function or with high quality. And, well, typical Bayesian stable isotope model shows how anchovies prey mainly on mycetes, while sardine prey mices and copepods of a small size because they are different uh, feeding behavior. This is more a filtering and this is more like consumer, like open the mouth and prey directly. Fatty acids also help us to know the different, for example, between these three mices. We can see here like slavery preys on microbial, diatoms and general phytoplankton because we see the fatty acid signal, typical fatty acid of these groups in this species. While, for example, in the other extreme, in the upstream, Neomyces is more related to carnivory markers and terrestrial and plant material. It also shows a higher traffic position, maybe because prey is more omnivorous and prey in everything in the upper, in the upper stream. While Ropal of Talmud is the more marine species and preys on M. slavery. Okay? So we have a 
very important gill, and inside this gill we have a very clear niche separation that maybe is the key of this high productivity. We have been working with the anchovy data. Recently we published maps relating anchovy with the variables in the estuary, and we found that they increase with uh, my seeds, but I'll go ahead. This is the connection. So we sell nutritional value of phytoplankton and organic matter. It's important for my seeds, and my seeds are important for anchovy in the story. These are deviation data from the mean, and we see when you have more my seeds, you will have more recruits in the story. Okay? These are the training data. And from now, it's a work that I am collaborating with uh, David Vassar Lab and, and the student, um, Frank Simon in the Yale University in the Ecology Department, using and applying wavelets to this time series. And I want to stop here like, to say that's why long-term ecological research sometimes is so important. We couldn't have this data set without 22 years of data. And it's the only way. So we cannot detect any cycle of 10 years, 7 years, ecology, any cycle in ecology of six, seven years without this kind of, of, of long-term data. These are wavelets on the biomass of mysids and, and anchovies in the estuary, okay? And at the period, season, like yearly period, like 365 days, we see the correspondence of high mysids and high period of anchovies high, and mainly low and low. So now, why this cycles, no? why some years are very high, some years are very low, are lower. And the main factor we think is the dam management, okay? Since 1930 that the dam was built, we have seen that the discharge are going down, okay? At the first years, in the 60s, in the 50s, in the 60s, more or less they they, they put in the, in the estuary the same water, maybe, that rain, that it was raining, but it had been decreasing with the years. At the same time, that reservoir, water reservoir capacity and irrigated area around Seville, Huelva, Cadiz, has been increasing. So it's, it's a, this the pattern. At the same time, precipitation has been decreasing historically, well, on the mean. When we apply this wavelet technique, to time series in the 30s from for rain and the fresh water discharge from the dam, we, again, we see that usually it rains every year, and we see here the, the 12 month period, okay? Draw periods are when you have no red here, and high rain seasons are when you have the, this red. At the first years, it kind of coincides with the dam, but the dam is putting less and less water in the system with the years, okay? And then the coincidence is not so high. If we do here an analysis of this um, data as, a index, as an index of seasonality, we can see that rain shows peaks of seasonality, more or less, but these peaks disappear in the, in the, dam, in the dam data. For example, here in the, for the 90s, you have no seasonality. There is no rain, no seasonality in the, in the dam discharge. Okay, if we detrain the data, by like focusing on, on this panel, detrending the precipitation and dam freshwater inflow data, we see in blue is the seasonal deviation of precipitation. So we can see like winter and late autumn, and late winter, November, December, and January, February, March are the typical rain, rain months here, okay? Blue, no, no blue, green, is our discharge from, 30, from 1931 to 1950, so the old data, or the old times discharge from the dam, it more or less follows the same pattern, well, it's not the, the same than precipitation, but it, they discharge more in winter and less in summer. But from 1991 to present, to 2008, is the yellow line, 
it has been kind of chain and they discharge a bit more in summer. The discharge in winter is less and delayed. And this is what we can see with the coherence between rain and dam discharge data. This is a coherence for the wavelet coherence. And when you have red, it means that they coincide in time. So they have, we have rain, we have discharge. And when you have no red, is that there's no coincidence between the two data set, okay? This in the history. Now go to the going to the Gulf of Cadiz fisheries. These are catch data, okay? Fishery catch data. And what we see is we see some pattern. I mean, we have two periods of high fisheries and years where the fishery were very, very bad. If we do the same wavelet analysis with the, this cache data for the same years to, for, to the freshwater discharge, we see some coincidence between this low seasonality or low catches and low freshwater discharge. Okay, high, high, then we have a period of low discharge, fisheries decrease, we have a period of low discharge, fisheries decrease. And why? Because what we found is that the discharge, this data are deviation from the mean, discharge are related in some way with the anchovy stock. These are independent stock assessment in the Wolf of Cali by the Institute, Spanish Institute of Oceanography. And we found some relationship. We found that when you have more freshwater discharge, you will have more anchovies. And this is the last graph. Why? Okay, again, in blue, in purple, we have anchovy in the fall, in autumn, in the Gulf of Cadiz, okay? And this red line is a measure of seasonality based on the wavelet coherence when they, so when rain and discharge coincide at the same time, so very winter, rainy winter, put a lot of water from the dam in the estuary, then we have a peak. When no, it goes down, okay? So what we see is when it goes up, when you have more seasonality, that means rain or the, the, the dam put water in the month of January, February, March, okay? You will have more fisheries, more, more, yeah, more catches or more, or, or the, the fishery increase, the catches increase. The, an, the anchovy in the Gulf of Cadiz increase, okay? Here we see the same, here we see the same. When it goes down, it goes down. And there is kind of correlation between seasonality of the discharge and anchovies in the Gulf of Cadiz. So in summary, we see here a water policy problem because until now, water has been managed, or the water policy has been managed thinking on agriculture, but not in other activities that could depend on this water, as in this case is fisheries. So this water policy management have has to change if we want to assure also fisheries and not only olives or any <laughs> irrigation activity in, the, in Andalusia. And the final message is that the estuary is not an isolated ecosystem. We have seen that it's connected to the freshwater management, but it's very important because we see seasonal migrations of plankton, of fishes, of crustaceans that live in the marine part and they spend part of their life in the estuary. Also, but also the estuary supports super, these mices and other, other crustacean species that are very important part of the supraventos. That is an ecosystem living close to the bottom in all the Gulf of Cadiz, mainly Doñana coast, okay? which are the main prey for many pelagic and demersal species in the Gulf of Cadiz, ahead of nutrients that fertilize or, and produce chlorophyll in all these being very important spawning area. And to show this idea of supraventos, just to show you, this is a transect with the Spanish Institute of Sonography. This is like transparency or it's beam attenuation light where you have, it's more red when you have something there that doesn't allow the, the light to, to go. Uh, 
you can think it's turbidity, you can think it's sediments, but most of this signal from the coast to 200, 100 meter depth are this. This is a video recorded by Oceana with the rope in the coast of Doñana. And maybe one of the, another reason to try to declare this part, part of the national park. <laughs> so these are zooplankton. And this is the bottom. This is at 10 meters depth. Not only chocos, but also Octopus, sea bass, anchovy, sardine, corvinas. These are the smicids that they are growing in the estuary and they are totally connected, the population. They go in, they go out. So all these are mycids in the bottom. These are anchovies. And well, this is light concentration, of course. But So from end to end, we see like how water management can influence in the estuary, can influence on the recruits in the estuary, but also in the biomass that the estuary export in terms of fishes, in terms of prey or predator or to the Gulf of Cadiz part. And it's not only here, two recent papers in Nature found globally the lack of connectivity, connectivity in the rivers and a high pressure index in all the river ecosystems. So it's, it's not unique that the estuary is closed by a dam and the connection in the river system is closed. It's something general. So yeah, that's all. Thank you. <laughs>